let's go ahead and kick this thing off. Uh, today, we want to uh, introduce you to a bunch of enhancements you can do on your custom visualization plugins that you've built in Superset. Um, if you haven't seen it already, there's a blog post that this goes along with, and we'll talk about that too. Um, and if you haven't built a Viz plugin before, we'll, we'll also be able to provide some resources that are a good start for that. Uh, but first off, let's kick it off with some introductions. I'm Evan Rosakis. I work with Preset, uh, which is a hosted version of Superset and has several other bells and whistles. But uh, I also have here today Michael Molina, who is uh, another Superset PMC member. Thanks for joining. Uh, Michael, if you're not familiar with him, uh, has done a bunch of work on various charts. Uh, he's worked on the drill to detail features and the drill by features. He's written migrations to deprecate legacy plugins. Uh, he's added a slew of today's features to Superset's new waterfall chart, which hasn't been released in an official Apache version yet, but it's coming soon. And he's an authority on all sorts of stuff that we're gonna be talking about today. Hello, Evan, someone is commenting that audio is a bit low. Oh, is it me? Okay, maybe I'll move my microphone a little closer. Hopefully that helps. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, so then first things first, uh, let's talk about how you can interact with this whole presentation today. Uh, the most important is that all of you should be on Slack if you're not already. So let me go ahead and drop a link with a Slack invitation into the chat. And uh, then there's also the Q&A tab, which is very important. You should see that in your Zoom controls control bar. And if you have a question, um, I would advise against asking it in the chat stream because that just kind of flows by. But the Q&A tab allows us to address these questions in an orderly fashion. Um, yeah, and then you know, email as a last resort if you can't get a hold of us otherwise. So what we're talking about today is, like I mentioned, a blog post uh, that just got published recently, and we kind of wanted to go through a live version of it. Here's the link to the blog post itself. And as you can see, this is part one. Uh, so there are some new plugins landing on the repo recently that we could talk about. If anyone's interested, there's a, there's a new map thing that's landing and possibly another different map soon. Uh, to just mention that um, ambiguously, intentionally. But what we wanna to cover today is all of the basics of uh, the things you can add to your custom visualization. So this is kind of a big overview and an introduction. Um, it's worth mentioning that it's, oh yeah, the Carto Diagram plugin developer is here. Yeah, thank you for that PR. We are taking a look at it, I promise, it's awesome. Um, so uh, yeah, this is, for those who have already kind of um, built their first skeleton of a plugin, perhaps using our prior blogs and videos, and this is going to add uh, different layers as we go through these blog posts and presentations, and hopefully we'll build up a comprehensive knowledge base for plugin development. But today we're just going to start from the top. So why would you do this? Um, Number one, of course, make your users happy. You want to have a feature-rich plugin that's going to have all the the nifty bells and whistles that plugins ought to have. But also, uh, you know, if if Superset as a project is going to adopt your plugin, we want to make sure that it has all of the things that are expected by users. And uh, if you have all of these things that are kind of the the, the must-haves and the should-haves as far as features go then we consider that a tier one plugin. Uh, it's kind of just an unofficial term we use to say that it has all of the things and acts as like a gold standard for users and um, as a code reference for other plugin developers. So let's get into some of these individual things. Um, but, uh, sorry, I forgot there was one more slide in here, but this, uh, as mentioned, this is a series, so we're not gonna get into everything. We won't be able to answer all your questions today about all the nitty gritty specifics. We'll do our best at the end. But um, we also need to mention that as we go through this series and start to show code and examples of these features being used, that not all of these plugins are created equal. So if you built with eCharts, that's cool. Um, NVD3 is deprecated, but people still build the stuff with D3. Um, technically, any JavaScript visualization framework could be used in a plugin for all sorts of reasons. But um, what you get out of the box for free will differ, and how you implement these details will differ from each of these plugin frameworks. Okay, so the must-haves. Um, 
if you want to get anything into the superset code base, you've got to have this stuff. Number one, most important thing is chart metadata. Uh, and we're going to go into a lot of detail about this later in the presentation. But these are the things that add all of the details in the chart picker or the viz gallery, whatever you want to call it, when you're adding a new chart in superset. So you can see all the thumbnails and um, descriptions and tags and uh, various forms of display of feature support. Um, then uh, color palette support. So there is another blog post, which I can send you a link to real quick that explains all about how custom color palettes can be built and applied to charts in dashboards or in the chart builder. And uh, your plugin will want to support these. Um, especially with the like custom overrides that people sometimes do where uh, you you might map a certain color to a certain series in your data. Dynamic controls are uh, another thing we're going to get into in a follow-up coming very soon because this is kind of essential. A lot of people, when they build their first plugins, they think, oh, this is going to be simple. And then before you know it, you've got the problem of having a giant wall of knobs and uh, you've got little selects and switches and sliders for all of the things that your plugin can possibly do. But you want to make it an orderly user experience with kind of a progressive reveal of controls that are relevant. Um, so this is just one example where you don't need to show this little inner diameter or inner radius uh, slider until you've actually selected that it is a donut chart. You click that little checkbox, the next control panel appears. There's some other stuff along these lines to make your control panel better. And we'll get into all that stuff too. Um, and another must have is that if you are building a plugin, uh, you should recycle, uh, adhere to the dry principle, which is don't repeat yourself. So if you're adding controls to your control panel, you should use them from the shared controls library that's built into Superset. And we'll get into all the details of all those ones that you might want to use, and it'll make your life a little easier as you build out that control panel. Also, Superset includes React Storybook, which is a gallery of where you can see all or most of these plugins in action, try them out, and try all the little uh, knobs and sliders there. And this is also a great way for developers to make sure that features are maintained. Uh, and then, of course, as far as maintenance goes, tests are very important, whether it's unit tests or end-to-end -end tests, and we'll get into all of that in the near future as well. All right. So then the should haves, those first things are like table stakes, got to have them. But then um, we get into things that you ought to do if you're building a plugin. And generic chart axes are one thing we've talked a lot about lately, <clears throat> if you could come to these other meetups. And the, the only reason this is not a must have is that not all charts have axes. <laughs> so if your chart does have an axis, then and it's not a table or a nightingale rose chart or you know whatever then um, if it does have an axis you should support this feature which superset was built originally to be a, a kind of a time series database client druid to be specific but uh, as it's evolved over the years there have been more and more uh, databases supported obviously and a lot of them um, a, a lot of these the use cases are built around categorical rather than uh, you know, temporal charts. So now this works and your chart should support it too. Especially because uh, generic chart access is enabled by default right now. Oh, that's true. Yeah, we should talk about the feature flag. So if you are running an older version of Superset, you'd want to turn on the generic chart access feature flag. But as of 3.0, uh, this feature is on by default and that feature flag is deprecated. So actually things are going to be simplified in the code base soon for a lot of plugins. And... Um, yeah, this is going to be, you know, a um, prime time feature. Okay, then normalizing and denormalizing of form data. This one's a little funny, but it's something that got added recently and has made the user experience a lot simpler. Um, in a nutshell, you can switch between charts much more easily than you used to be able to. It used to be that if you switched charts, it would just kind of nuke all your form data in the control panel. But now you can switch charts uh, more smoothly, meaning that... Um, control values are maintained from one plugin to the other. So here you can see that the uh, uh, the metric is presented, or, or uh, preserved rather, as you go from, uh, in this case, a bar chart over to a different chart. And also it maintains 
the non-shared values. So say you used that inner radius control on a pie chart, and then you switched over to a table chart. That inner radius control is no longer relevant, right? But rather than destroying that value, it's maintained in memory. So when you, if you were to switch back to the pie chart, then that control is restored. So it's kind of, it's safe to maneuver around between different chart types as well as being smoother. So we, we'll get into how you can support that. And then uh, contextual menu support. This is uh, basically the little menu. When you right click something in a chart, you get these options that we'll go into like drill by, drill to detail, cross filters. We've covered all of that stuff in previous meetups. But that little menu uh, is actually something that you'll want to support in plugins. And not all libraries support this very well. For example, the now deprecated NVD3 does not play well with that, which is one of the reasons it's on the way out. Um, and as far as those features that go under that contextual menu, we've got drill to detail, which shows a tabular representation of the data powering a visualization. Uh, you've got drill by. Uh, which we have a blog post for in case you haven't seen it in the early meetups and so forth, but this is a hot feature, I guess you could say, uh, where you can uh, you know, drill level after level into various dimensions of your data, uh, hierarchical or otherwise. And then cross-filtering, which allows you to click on, say, the bar of a bar chart or something like that, wedge of a pie chart and emit a filter to the rest of the charts in the dashboard that are scoped. Um, somebody's asking if they can do drill with a map. Uh, if you want to stick that in the Q&A tab, we'll circle back to that. Um, it's a, there is a bit of an open question in the community about that. Then, let's see. Oh, currency formatting. So yeah, we've added some features in Superset recently that allow people to configure a default currency and number format in their configuration. And there have also been enhancements that allow you to set that on a per column basis at the in the data set editor or supersets semantic layer. And you can also support uh, this sort of formatting within your chart controls. So if you want to build a chart that allows you to pick a currency or set a num number format uh, specifically for that chart, then you can add these controls. You can even do it. Um, you, you, can, you can get fancy with it. We'll get into that. Um, and legend interaction, this is another thing that depending on your library, you may or may not get kind of for free. You might not have to add a lot of custom event handlers in your JavaScript code, but uh, it's a nice thing to be able to uh, click on uh, the legend and have some interactivity to select or deselect series. Uh, like you see in these screenshots. Um, incidentally, Michael added the all in inverse little buttons there. So thank you for that. Uh, yeah, th that's helpful when you want to compare different series. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then the as needed features. So these are things that are kind of the uh, odds and ends, the bric-a-brac, the junk drawer of features, but there's a lot of good stuff you can add. Advanced analytics is one. Um, this is advanced. There's quite a lot to talk about here. But uh, for example, one of the things you might do is say you're building a line chart and there's null values in the series, you can add this uh, zero imputation fill method and it'll make it a complete line instead of a few random dots or line segments. So, uh, you know, time comparisons, all sorts of fun stuff you can add there, which will affect your query that underlies your chart. Conditional coloring, this is, uh, there's various ways to approach this actually as a feature in terms of UI. This is just one random screenshot where uh, you can set kind of thresholds and have shaded colors, but this can, uh, this can interact with your dashboard color palettes. Uh, you can make it a little more bespoke, but um, it's, it's another feature you can add. Then post-processing operations. So this is something where you'd actually get into the Python side of things. Uh, not so long ago, the superset plugins were uh, re-architected a bit so that they could be entirely JavaScript instead of requiring Python. But there are certain use cases, like say pivoting a pivot table, where you'd want to use um, you know, pandas or something on the back end in Python to transform your data in a specific way before sending that result back to the client, your browser. So you can extend the Python uh, code base to support different post-processing operations or have your plugin utilize ones that are already there. Then predictive analytics. Uh, this 
is leveraging the profit library, um, which exists to just take the data that exists, run it through that library, and uh, you get confidence bands and all of that fun stuff that you can draw on your chart in numerous fun ways. I didn't take too many screenshots of this chart, but actually there's a lot of uh, different ways you can visualize this. Then annotation layers. Uh, I'll be perfectly honest, this is not Superset's easiest feature to use or develop around. Uh, this feature needs some love. It's not supported by every chart, but it does exist and it can be improved. Uh, we hope to get around to that as a community effort one of these days, but uh, you can add an annotation layer to a chart using a secondary chart as a source of those annotations. Um, so you can set up your chart to be either source data or you can set it to pull in data from another chart. Um, and there are some document, there is some documentation on this feature in case you haven't played with it. So I'll just drop that in the chat as well. I probably have more links to more of this stuff, by the way. I might be skipping a few links that we can follow up on later. So if anybody wants resources, just holler and we'll we'll get them in the QA time slot. So then um, that's kind of an overview of the most commonly added extensions that you might not get with a vanilla plugin out of the box when you use the, the code generator to kind of build the scaffolding of a plugin and just you know make some data appear in a visual manner on screen. Uh, we're gonna get into all of those things in some depth in coming blog posts and meetups. But today, what we wanted to get into a little bit is that first one uh, of, of the must-haves, the table stakes, which is metadata. Uh, and all of this is on that blog post, which I will link to again right here. Uh, but just to cover it briefly, wanted to show you the type definition, uh, which exists in the JavaScript code base and shows you all of the metadata that you can add to your plugins definition. Uh, we go into each one of these on the blog post, so I won't hit all of them, but we'll, we'll scroll through the blog post in a second and kind of hit some highlights. Uh, you can also see an example configuration. This one's from the eCharts uh, generic uh, chart plugin, which can be used as a you know line chart, area, bar chart, whatever. Um, and you can see some of these things about the generic x-axis that we were talking about earlier. Like there's some little ternary switches in here where if it, you know, depending on whether your generic x-axis is turned on or off, that the chart name or the chart description actually change. And, that's some stuff we're gonna clean up later when that feature flag is officially gone. But looking through it, you see some of these different things like behavior. Uh, we talked about those features like drill to detail and drill by. So if your chart supports these, then you would add those behaviors there. And that actually enables some other little bits in the code that make it work. Uh, similarly, interactive chart, perhaps this isn't the greatest name in the world, but that means cross filters. Uh, then you can add a category. You get one category to drop your viz into. You you can certainly add more, uh, but I wouldn't. I would stick to the existing categories in Superset unless you're creating a whole swath of plugins all on your own. The idea is to kind of group them together and keep them organized. Um, then credits. I guess you could use this for all sorts of different things. Like say you had a particular author that worked on it, but typically you would use this to uh, to give some credit back to the open source community if you use the library or something like that that you want to um, give a shout out to. The description goes into the uh, viz picker right here to skip ahead a slide. Uh, yeah, so here's, yeah, maybe this is a better way to walk through it. Uh, yeah, you've got your description here. You can have as many labels as you want. This thing scrolls, which is nice. Uh, you can add thumbnails within your plugin and you can add as again as many as you want and it, it also scrolls so if you have a plugin that has all sorts of different layout modes or different features and bells and whistles you, your users can enable it's really nice to show those there so people can look around and figure out what plugin they want to use and say oh this does do the thing i wanted to do it's got the tooltips or whatever um, and then these are some tags up here that are actually highlighted within the superset code base. I think you can uh, adjust this on your installation if you need to and you run superset on your own, but uh, popular is kind of actually a reflection of that tier one plugin support that we were mentioning that if, if you click popular here, you get a list of all the charts that include 
the bulk of those features that we just ran through. And if your supports those, then stick it in there when you open your PR. That'd be fantastic. Um, oh, and I was going to switch over to the blog post itself, which is right here. Um, so we talked about credits and thumbnails and behaviors. I think there's a couple of other behaviors, but I don't remember them off the top of my head, honestly. Uh, then let's see. Yeah, these ones are where it starts to get interesting. And I think we'll cover these in those future blog posts, but like uh, can be annotation types means that your chart will support other charts as an annotation layer. And uh, this is the, the inverse of that, where you can, it, it'll say that your plugin will support a different chart um, as an annotation data source. And deprecated is something that got snuck in there just to kind of hide old plugins. Um, if you start looking at supersets code base around plugins, you're going to find that there are actually a bunch of legacy plugins that use an older API endpoint and have a bunch of uh, things like they use um, some Python code that we're trying to slowly get rid of. And some of these are at the point where they shouldn't be used by users to create new things, uh, but we can't just delete them yet. And the reason might, is usually that you have dashboards built with these charts that are kind of legacy dashboards using these legacy charts. And over time, we're going to be building migrations so that we can actually get rid of those charts with newer replacements and then remove these deprecated charts. But long story short, this hides them from the biz, biz picker. Um, query object count. There are certain plugins that allow you to do uh, multiple SQL queries and take uh, multiple sets of data. Uh, mixed time series is one example, but there's all sorts of things you could invent with this. Uh, pretty much every plugin, except for a couple of exceptions, uses just one query, but you know you could go nuts uh, depending on what your use cases are. Then uh, label, oh yeah, that's this, I don't know if you can see it, but this little tiny thing that says featured. Uh, you can add featured or you can add deprecated and uh, you can add customized descriptions that go over that to say why it's been deprecated or why it's featured if you want to get a, a little more um, descriptive there. So I think this is the bulk of the stuff um, that I wanted to show just as a an overview. So if you have questions about any of these features, what they mean, what they're for, how they're developed, um, or if you think there's anything missing from this kind of overview, that's that's the stuff I'd love to dig into in the Q&A. Um, and then we can kind of start to build this knowledge base and build these presentations around diving into more of the specifics, including code, um, and maybe even building some of these plugins with these features. Uh, we've got a couple of plugin ideas in mind that would be new ones we'd like to add to Superset. So those might be a good thing to kind of build over the coming weeks. Uh, or we can go through some of our older plugins. Uh, Michael and I were just talking about doing a, a sort of plugin feature audit. And so we're probably going to turn up a couple of plugins that are missing a couple of features. And maybe we can bolt those new features on and talk about those PRs in upcoming webinars. Um, but the next one I was planning on, if you're interested, and let me know if, if you're not, is uh, getting into those uh, dynamic controls. And so there's a few other things that would be included there. Uh, where'd my little notes go? But they are, um, so there's what I guess you would call conditional controls, which is when, uh, like the example I showed where one control might hide or show itself depending on the value of another control. There's um, dynamic controls where you can change the value of one control based on another control. So they're kind of adjusting themselves as, as you move around. Then, um, yeah, we can go into all of the shared controls that are available out of the box for you to build your plugin with, what they're for, and, you know, little caveats, pros and cons. And then there was, I think, uh, one other category of um, thing I wanted to cover. Maybe it says here. Oh, yeah, instant controls. That's right. So some of the controls in your control panel will actually adjust your query and need to go fetch data from your database. But many of them that just tune the display properties of your control and change a prop on a React component or something like that can be instant. That's what the little lightning bolt is usually used for in the control panel. So we'll teach you about all of that. Um, and yeah, that's the next episode. So 
that's what I wanted to get into today. And um, let's see, we've got a few questions and let's get into it. Um, one of them was, are there any plans to revive the dynamic plugins? And absolutely, yes. But this is kind of a big architectural undertaking. So the story here, for those that don't know, is uh, we do want to make it so that Superset is eventually more like your browser or uh, your IDE, where you can just kind of add plugins by saying, here's where the plugin lives, like a URL to a JavaScript bundle, and then it'll just load into Superset. Um, we, the last time we were working on that was probably a couple of years ago. Uh, and at the time we were on Webpack 3 or 4, I believe. But since then, we've upgraded to Webpack 5. And Webpack 5 allows a lot more um, functionality around dynamic loading of remote JavaScript modules that didn't exist earlier. So in the prior iterations and attempts at dynamic plugins, we had to do a lot of kind of hacky stuff to make it work but I think it's a lot more plausible now. We just need to talk about all the UI details, all of the kind of schemas of how these things are stored in Superset. And um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of little moving parts in making that work, especially since once we release that as a feature, we're gonna have to support it basically forever. Uh, so we wanna get it right. Then uh, somebody says, is there a 3D CAD model plugin, data that interacts with a 3D model? And no. Um, I do remember somebody mentioning this on Slack, asking about it, and I don't know all the different CAD data formats. I imagine there's some sort of thing you can query for that's going to give you some sort of, you know, point cloud data or, you know, vectors and, and you know, edges and vertices, um, something that you could query that would feed a CAD plugin. And if there is a JavaScript library that actually takes that sort of data, you can conjure from a database and draw it as 3D and get some controls to spin it around and whatever you want to do, then heck yeah. Um, we'd love to see that. Uh, I think I should also mention that if you do want to contribute one of the plugins that you're building to Superset open source, it has to be license compatible. And there's a couple of things there, actually. So the code has to be license compatible with the Apache license. Uh, and there's a there's a whole slew of software licenses that work in that model. But the other thing is that being an open source project, we can't usually rely upon paid services to make the plugins work that we support in open source. So uh, we do have certain plugins that require license keys. Like for example, the Mapbox one comes to mind where you have to have a Mapbox API key, but you can go get that thing for free. So it's not it's not like a deal breaker. You don't have to pay money. So it's kind of on the edge there of open sourceness, if that's a word. Um, but if we do do a CAD one, you know, it shouldn't be some CAD software that costs you thousands of dollars, thousands of dollars a month to display this data. It should be something that you could get an API key and use for free. Um, on how does the localization for chart metadata work? So I think there might be a quick capture of that right here. So um, this little T method that wraps a lot of strings here is the JavaScript translation framework that we use um, under the hood. So if you have a bunch of stuff you want to translate, from, from this part of the code basis perspective, you just wrap a T around it, and there you go. It'll magically work, except that it won't because those translations don't exist. So in the superset documentation, there's um, an area where you can add translation strings. There's all these files that end in .po. Uh, I don't remember, don't ask me what that file extension stands for. But uh, you can go in there and add the English string as a key and add whatever other language you want as a value. And these language files exist for numerous languages. Oh, uh, thanks for the link. Oh, oh, you send it to me as a direct message. I need to send it to the whole crowd. Oh, let me fix that. Um, but uh, yeah, and then, uh, oh, that's to hosts and panelists. I think you need to send to everyone. Um, but then, uh, yeah, so once you've created these strings in the correct language file, you, there's a little script you can run, and that actually flattens out the .po files to JSON, and that gets picked up by Superset's front end when it's running. Um, so it's a little bit of a goofy process, but that's probably something we should actually add to our um, 
our docs and our webinar as we go forward with this demo. Then somebody is asking about enabling cross filtering on one of their map plugins. Um, and yeah, so this is something that you'd, there's quite a lot to it actually. You're gonna have to probably touch a fair amount of files. I don't know if, <laughs> I don't know if you wanna answer this one, Michael, but we need to support the contextual menu. Um, yeah. And then there's, there's emitting the cross filter and there's receiving the cross filter is kind of the two main areas of work. Um, yeah. yeah, I think you need to enable the behavior, the first one, uh, directed chart behavior in your metadata file. And then it's just a matter of adding, listening to the events of your library. And then just using like, you can, for example, use the same example as like a line chart that contains uh, the logic to handle uh, cross filtering. So you just like listen to the event in your chart and then propagate some information to the to superset. And then that dimension, when you click on it, it will automatically appear in the chart menu. So it's, it's pretty simple. It's just a matter of like connecting the events to your chart library. Yeah, so the, the plan here is to show some code examples when we get to that segment. So um, when we do cross filtering, we'll probably use eCharts as an example since that's typically what people are gonna be building their plugins around, but um, that code might vary wildly if you're using like a D3 map or you know some other map format or a different library completely. You might be building a, something with VX. I don't know. Um, but then actually related to, um, to maps perhaps, is somebody asking, can drill by and cross filtering be enabled for non e-charts, custom plugin charts? And uh, the answer is yes, absolutely. Yep. So, um, well, one thing I should have mentioned is that most of these when we talk about those things that are in the contextual menu, like drill by, drill to detail, and uh, cross filters, at least two of them, the drill to detail and drill by ones are also uh, available via the little three dot menu at the top right of a chart when it's in the dashboard. Um, but most users we find uh, expect to be able to right click the chart. So whatever you're building your chart with, um, it needs to be able to support the event handlers to capture that right click and append the the little menu. And then the rest of it, uh, I think can be handled by pretty much any framework you'd wanna use. It's, it's, it's external to the viz itself because you're gonna be popping open all the drill by stuff in a modal and that modal is handled by superset, not by the plugin library. So it should be all good. Um, Cross filtering is the same way there's, uh, there's a, a layer called uh, data mask that receives these, this cross filter event um, that says what the filter is and will filter down the data set. And th then it's up to your chart to display that appropriately, whether you want to kind of hide the other stuff or dim the other stuff. Uh, that's, that's up to you as a plugin author. I think we got to all the all the questions. There must be more questions. If anyone has anything else they want to add, the Q and A tab is wide open at the moment. This went a little faster than I expected too. So if you have questions on what these features are in general, I'm happy to kind of go back and talk about a little bit more detail on how you could implement all of these. But we don't have the code examples for the bulk of them uh, available yet. I'm just going to share a time series chart code. That's like a good example for how you connect and listen for events. And then how do you like what kind, what type of information you need to assemble to pass to superset so that you have drill by, you drill to detail and cross filtering available too. Yeah, just, yeah, if you just check the, uh, a little bit below. Oops, sorry, wrong button. I've got too many Zoom controls in the way and I can hardly see what I'm typing. Um, okay. No problem. There is like event handlers. I think there's a constant call event handlers. And it's on line 139. Yeah. Yeah, this one. So for example, here, 
you can see we are using eCharts and then the eCharts library just accepts a configuration called event handler. So you configure like which events you listen to. So here, for example, we're listening to like click event, mouse out, mouse over, legend, state changes, context menu, that's the right click. And then here, like we just assemble the information that we need to, can you scroll down a little bit? Go to um, more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Uh, yeah, line 214, like on context menu. So this is like the information that you need to pass to enable drill to detail, cross filtering and drill by. So this is one example. So if you have like a different library than eCharts, it's the same process. You just need to listen for the events of your library and then assemble this context and call these functions. And then everything will appear in the menu. And I guess it's kind of kind of similar for the legend interactive legend support too. Um, that you're going to be yeah. There, there's a there's a if you scroll a little bit up, there's like events for legend state change. A little bit more. It's line. Uh, oh right. One fifty six. Yeah, legend state change. Yeah, legend state change. Yeah. So, so the... pretty much like here, you react to the like changing. Uh, your legend. Yeah, so a lot of these things are going to vary pretty wildly depending on how your plugin library is built. Um, but it's generally possible. Um, and as far as things that are possible and the level of detail that people want to get into, this is one of the reasons we wanted to do the overview today was so that I can actually get some of your feedback. So I'm, I'm curious from the folks that showed up here, go ahead and use the chat, but let us know kind of what level of detail you're looking for as we do the next iterations of this in the coming weeks and the next blog posts. And if there are any features uh, of plugins that you're looking to develop that we can more directly address. And if you don't wanna do it in the, the chat right now, or if you're seeing this on YouTube in the future, hello future people, then uh, just DM me on Slack or drop it in the, uh, uh, the, the customizing superset or improving superset channels. Those are both kind of fitting. Yeah, let us know what you want to get into, and uh, we will address things. Oh yeah, somebody's asking about uh, the package JSON and what that's all about. Uh, yeah, maybe that's another topic we should actually get into is how the dependencies work with plugins, but it's a little funny. For those of who have built JavaScript applications before using NPM, uh, all of your dependencies, like let's say you're using eCharts to build a plugin would go in your um, your regular dependencies um, in your package JSON, which I guess I could probably find. Click on superset front end. Oh yeah, I could just look at the main one. I was going to look at a plugin one. Actually. Yeah. Let me show you a plugin one because that's where they get a little unusual. Um, so this particular plugin needs these libraries to exist. Like you can't have an eChart without eCharts, right? Uh, but then some of these other ones are actually pulled from elsewhere in superset that already exist in the main code base. So peer dependencies are chart controls that I was, I was alluding to those uh, controls you can add to your control panel that exist elsewhere. That's where they come from. There's all sorts of other little helper libraries and utilities that are in superset UI core. And then of course, it's a React application, so you must have React. So um, all of this stuff goes in your package, uh, JSON file, including uh, the stuff that's gonna be published to NPM, like the title and the entry point for the code. But, um, and then when you actually bundle that up and you say NPM install, it'll create what's called a package lock file uh, that somebody was asking about here. and that package lock file is all of the versions that like this one has this little carrot here so it's looking for d3 array that is um, 1.2.x basically and uh, so when you install it your package lock version will have the exact version of that dependency um, that's a shorthand version of explaining it i think let me know if i didn't address what you're actually asking uh, Related question, is there a plan to add a custom chart without using a fork of superset? Um, 
Yeah, you already can actually. Uh, I should dig up the link to this and uh, send it, but I don't want to go diving around YouTube right now. But there was a there was a meetup that happened a while back um, with a PMC member from Nielsen that was talking about deploying plugins. And long story short, they just need to be on npm, and then uh, that's to so to develop a chart, you don't need a fork. I should say, uh, you can develop an npm package that's a Viz plugin, it's a JavaScript module. It can live on its own, be anywhere on the internet, really. Um, but if you want to install that remote package, any random NPM module that is a superset Viz plugin, currently you do have to change the code base of superset. There's a file called uh, mainpreset.ts, I believe, and then there's like a setup extensions.ts that you might have to touch. Uh, but those two files, are where you actually instantiate the plugin. You say, here's the little key name for it, and here's where the, the package lives. So yeah, you'd, you'd install the NPM package, you'd load the NPM package, and that stuff still has to happen in code. So you would need to uh, change your fork, or if you're a preset customer, you know, contact us <laughs> at preset, and we'll, we, can, we can do some uh, gymnastics to get that to happen. Um, yeah, hopefully that addresses that one. And maybe it's worth mentioning on that note that all of the plugins that are in Superset are their own NPM package. Uh, Superset just happens to be a mono repo. So there's actually, I can, as, you, as I was just alluding to, this, this package JSON file is part of one plugin and all of the plugins are right here. So all of these are their own little NPM modules. And in theory, you could use these outside of Superset. Um, there is a way to do so. It's not widely done, but it can be done. Um, and thankfully, now that they're all on the same code base, it's a heck of a lot easier to maintain these things than it used to be. Is it possible to see a code block of drill, drill up, drill down, cross filter functionality on Mapbox? Uh, gosh, I don't know. You'd have to go spelunking just as much as me. But if I were to dig into the source, uh, I don't know where it is. I've not looked for it. Maybe we'll get lucky. Yeah, I don't know. We're going to have to go um, drilling around in here and find it. But this, which I'll drop in the chat, is the entry point to the Mapbox code. Actually, Evan, uh, we don't support it currently okay. in the Mapbox because it's a legacy one. So what, when, one way to quickly see if the plugin supports or not is just go to the plugin index. So you, if you just check like index.js, you see that there is no behavior oh, associated that... with like a drill to detail. OK. I thought that emitted cross filters at least. Uh, maybe I'm mistaken. But yeah, it's not in the behaviors. It has no behaviors entries whatsoever. Okay. Um, someone's asking about using the back end APIs to create views in a separate front end app. Yeah, it's an open API. You can build whatever you want with it. Um, it's not in the scope of building Viz plugins, but yes, you can build all sorts of things. You can also build uh, embedded dashboards using the embedded SDK. If that's kind of halfway to what you're talking about. All right. Well, it seems the questions are slowing down. Um, so if we didn't get to anything that you were asking, then by all means, reach out to us. And again, please do ask questions because this is going to be informing where we go with building out the future blog posts that go more deeply into code for each of these features. There will be several of these blog posts and probably uh, one of these kind of webinars every two or three features that we document in blog posts and just kind of dive into the code and look at working examples and tweak on things. So if you were looking for more code digging today, then uh, you know we'll, we'll get to that soon. Um, and yes, this will be shared. It'll be on YouTube soon. And anyone who registered for today's event will receive that link soon. 
Okay, we'll give everybody uh, 14 minutes back-ish. And thank you very much for joining today. Uh, and thank you, Michael, for co-hosting. I appreciate all of you. And uh, we'll see you on Slack. Thank you.